And I'm going to turn the program over to Harriet Sugarman. Um, I'm not sure if anybody does not know Harriet Sugarman here. <laughs> because Harriet Sugarman is well known um, in this whole area for um, what she does on environmental issues and climate mama. So let me give you a little bit of her bio, which is pages long, but I'm sparing you with only a few things. So, she's a featured speaker at last year's UNA, United Nations USA Global Engagement Summit at the UN in New York City. Harriet is recognized nationally as an influencer and connector in the climate movement. She's executive director of Climate Mama and reaches individuals in over 110 countries in all 50 states. She's also a leader and mentor with Al Gore's Climate Reality Project and there is more, but if I did more, we would have little time for our important program tonight. But she does teach at Ramapo College, and um, she's great. So the program is being turned over to Harriet Sugarman. Thank you very much. Our... Thank you so much, Rhoda. And um, if I can ask everybody to uh, thank Rhoda and your team at the Network for Responsible Public Policy. Because you, you continue, Rhoda, to bring us urgent issues that we need to learn the facts on and really understand all sides of timely issues. Uh, this could not be more timely. Uh, and things are happening. I know we're going to hear from our speakers uh, this week here in our state that are really relevant to what we're speaking upon and um, You do that you help us understand you bring us uh, the facts and you help us all uh, Equip ourselves to be able to talk to all of our neighbors and for each person that's here There are ten more that will you know watch on behalf on the videos that are here, etc so I encourage you all to um, come out to more programs that we have and to really, um, we are thrilled and I am honored to get to introduce um, both Justin and Bruce and I'm going to invite you Bruce to join us here so I can introduce you as well um, up on the stage. We, uh, with these wonderful programs that uh, Rhoda and the network bring to us, she also uh, works to bring us the experts, the people, the key people that really understand the public policy, that have the facts at their, at their uh, fingertips. And we are so fortunate to have uh, Justin Makulka and Bruce Campbell with us tonight. Um, and I'm going to introduce them in a moment. Uh, how the evening is going to go, we are going to hear from our experts. And then I know that all of you, or many of you, probably have burning questions, no pun intended, um, on that one. But as I do, uh, because this is a really relevant issue for not only us nationally and in our area, but for our, uh, here in Bergen County. And we are fortunate to have, uh, as Rhoda said, Paula and many wonderful people on uh, the coalition to ban um, uh, oil trains here. Uh, and around the state, we are fortunate to have politicians, uh, local and state politicians that are working on behalf uh, of us on these issues. We're fortunate to have environmental and climate organizations that are working together with civic-minded people on these issues uh, here. And, and yet, uh, the bill on this issue in our state legislature was pulled this week. Why? And so we have many questions for you, and we look forward to hearing from you. So let me um, introduce our speakers for the evening. Uh, Bruce Campbell is a former executive director of the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives. He is the author of three major reports on the Lac-Megantic rail disaster, and his 2019 book, which is outside as well, called The Lac-Megantic Rail Disaster, Public uh, Betrayal and Just Deni uh, Justice Denied, uh, is a wealth of information uh, and one I would recommend that you all uh, look at and consult. For Bruce's work on this issue, he was awarded a Law Foundation of Ontario Community Leadership in Justice Fellowship, and he was a visiting professor at the University of Ottawa in the Faculty of Law. 
Currently, Bruce is an adjunct professor at York University in the faculty, faculty of university of um, uh, in the faculty of environmental studies. At York University is in Toronto, and a senior fellow at Ryerson University Center for uh, Free Expression. Uh, Justin Makulka is an investigative journalist and. Uh, he has done many stories with the independent news and research uh, organization Desmog, which is uh, the world's number one source for accurate fact-based information on global warming and fossil fuel industry mismanagement campaigns. So uh, Justin works to help us uh, understand the facts, to uh, really and clearly see what's happening. And for the past five years, he has been reporting on the growing threat of explosive oil and ethanol trains across North America. Justin as well has a book that we also have um, outside here that was uh, published last year called Bomb Trains, How Industry Greed and Regulatory Failure Put the Public at Risk. And Justin holds degrees in uh, environmental engineering from Cornell University. So we truly have the experts on this topic with us tonight. And gentlemen, I'm going to turn it over to you. So thank you so much for being here. It's great to be here. Um, thank you all for coming. Uh, it was an eventful trip. I almost didn't make it, but I'm here. Um, I won't go into detail. Um, and thank you, Harriet. Uh, thank you to the network, Paula and Broda, uh, and the, the sponsors uh, of, uh, of this event. I think it's uh, really important work that uh, that you do with the network uh, in in pr providing this kind of education and engagement to uh, uh, to the community people in the community um, so uh, I, I've called the, the title of my presentation uh, a cautionary tale it's a little bit different uh, than uh, the title of uh, of my book uh, which, uh, as Harry's, Harriet said, is public betrayal justice denied. Um, but I wanted to capture, because I think it's a, it, it's a tale that needs to be told uh, for, and I've traveled uh, across North America, uh, in large part, uh, including the US and Canada, in large part to, to Fritz Edler from the Railway Workers United, who is here tonight. I wanted to say hello to Fritz as well. Um, and so it's a tale that 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 needs to be needs to be told. Uh, the the French edition, because Lac, Lac Megantic uh, is a remote community uh, in the southeast or corner of Quebec. It's about 25 miles from the border with the state of Maine. Uh, it's the population is 6,000. Um, people go to Lac Megantic. To be in Lac Megantic, they don't go there to go somewhere else. Uh, it was originally f uh, uh, formed or uh, settled uh, by Scottish and French uh, uh, Canadians, and gradually the Scots were assimilated. And so you'll find people there with Scottish names who don't speak a word of English. Um, and in, in fact, the large majority of the community does not speak English. So this was really important for me to, to have this book uh, uh, published in French. And I, it was published in October, it was released in October, and I did uh, my first book launch in the town of Lac Megantic um, at to the rebuilt, uh, uh, nightclub where most of the people died. Uh, so as you can imagine, it was a really, really emotional uh, event, uh, but it was also very, they were very generous to me. It was a full house. They were very in, in, um, in encouraging uh, for me uh, to continue my work to tell their story. I don't speak in any official capacity for the town, and there is controversy in the town. I really, on, on behalf of the people that I've become close friends with, and there are activists in the town, and there are many, uh, their 
you know, it's greetings from them. Uh, they're, they want me to tell the story. They want the story to be told so it doesn't befall what happened uh, in, in their community. And, and you notice, um, well, in, in French it says an inquiry into the catastrophe when public powers derail. I actually like the cover and the title better in French than I do in English. Um, anyway, so that's, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about, um, I mean, I go back and look at this from uh, the, uh, the beginning of um, the, the kind of the, the, the change in policy in the, in the early to mid 80s. Uh, and I trace, I trace the interaction of deregulation, privatization, austerity, and many of you would be familiar with those same policies and how they've unfolded uh, south of the border, uh, south of our border, north of your border. Um, so, so, and, and I trace how the safety precautions were systematically eroded. Uh, and so what I wanted to do in this book, um, Leonard Cohen wrote, there is a crack, a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. Well, I, with this book, wanted to find the cracks to let the light in about what happened, why it happened, who is responsible, and who has been held accountable, who has not been held accountable. So that's kind of my, my, my basic, uh, uh, my fundamental goal in writing this book. Um, you know, I've said a few words about the town. It was founded in the mid 19 well, in 1884, as a railway town. It was part of Canadian Pacific's uh, uh, Trans uh, Pacific to uh, Atlantic. They they ran it through Maine, and they had a, a subsidiary in Maine um, because they wanted to have year-round access. And before the St. Lawrence Seaway was built you didn't have year-round access through the St. Lawrence River. So that, that gave them year-round access. And it's been a railroad. It still is an important railroad town. Um, uh, it's a resource-producing town. Agriculture, uh, granite, and forest products are the main, main ones. Um, it, it, uh, it is also become, it's also a beautiful area. Lac Megantic is a is a beautiful lake, and so it's it's become a tourist attraction. There's a beautiful telescope on one of the mountains, which is famous that that people go to, um, and bikers and hikers, and 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 so it it and it's a public administration uh, center. But it's it's a small town. It's a it's a, it's a it's a town of six thousand. Uh, you can imagine if this had happened uh, in in this community or in Baltimore. Um, so this is, this is a, a, a map of the journey of the Back and Shale um, oil. Um, it was going from, from Newtown to St. John, New Brunswick on the East Coast. A company called Irving Oil had bought um, uh, the shipment for, for re because it, was, it turned out to be cheaper than buying it from overseas at that particular time. It went down through uh, Minneapolis, uh, in Chicago, Detroit, and over into uh, Windsor, Ontario, and then up through Toronto and Montreal, and that's where, that's where uh, it, it parked before it took the next leg of, of the trip uh, on that dotted line there through through um, through the state of Maine, from Lac Megantic to the state of Maine, uh, and then up to uh, to St. John. So that's that's what a loading terminal looks like um, at Newtown. Uh, that, by the way, that oil was misclassified as highly as as low volatility. It came in as 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 medium to high volatility. Uh, and it went out as low volatility, um, misclassified, of course. Um, and that's where, that was the destination of the trains. Big, big refinery, a lot of its oil that it's, that's refined there, um, it actually is shipped down uh, to refine, or to places on the, uh, 
on the east coast of the US. So these are two of the characters that I talk about um, in my book on the, uh, uh, the I don't have a pointer, uh, but the, the, the guy with the red tie is a guy named Hunter Harrison. And if there's anybody that knows anything about railroads, they, uh, they know about Hunter Harrison. Uh, you either love him or hate him. Um, uh, he, uh, he actually uh, became the, uh, the CEO of Canadian National when Canadian National was privatized. Uh, in the, it used to be a publicly owned corporation until the mid-90s, and then it was, was privatized, became a North American company, bought Illinois Central. He was working for Illinois Central. He eventually became the CEO of CN, and that's, wh that's where he really kind of implemented his precision railroading formula, which was basically run fewer trains, longer trains, fewer people, those you have left, make them work longer hours, have a culture of intimidation, uh, I would say, with, uh, with, the, with the workers. Um, but he was, um, but uh, shareholders liked him. You know, he was really good for shareholder value. He got that uh, operating ratio down, the ratio between expenses and income. Um, it, so the guy on, uh, that he's shaking his hand with uh, is a hedge fund manager, uh, probably lives close to here, uh, from a, a New York-based Pershing Square. Uh, when Pershing, when Bill Ackman got interested in Canadian Pacific, now this is uh, Bill uh, um, Hunter Harrison re resigned from. Uh, he retired from CN in 2009, so he's retired now. This is 2012. Bill Ackman says he doesn't know anything about railroads, but he knows about shareholder value and he knows how to increase it. And so that's what he did. He forced the, ex the board that was in place at the time out, put his own people in, hired Hunter Harrison. CP um, uh, was the one of the largest carriers of uh, fracking sand and oil uh, had, with the exception of Warren Buffett's BS, BSNF, uh, he had, they had the most track. So there was, they saw the potential. They saw the potential and uh, he, he was hired. So those are two of the, the, the key players. Uh, the other one is a guy named Ed Burkhardt. Who, who lives in Chicago and he has a, a holding company called, which he still owns uh, as far as I know, uh, it's called Rail World. And it, uh, it's a holding company that has a number of short line railroads in the US, uh, in Eastern Europe. I don't know if he's still in New Zealand, uh, but he is sort of a, a image on a smaller scale uh, than Hunter Harrison, uh, he 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 um, he was a major shareholder in Wisconsin Central in the 90s, and he was you know cost cutting, cost cutting, laser focused on profits and cost cutting, and he was a pioneer in what are called single person crews, uh, single person, and that that figures greatly in the story as it as it proceeds. Um, and so he tried to get single-person crews into Wisconsin Central in the 90s, and the state congress said, no way, this is a guy that doesn't care about safety, and blocked him. So he was blocked from doing that, and eventually he left uh, uh, Wisconsin Central and formed his own company, uh, but not before there was a major derailment spillage and, and fire in a town called Weowaga in Wisconsin. Uh, fortunately, there were no deaths, uh, but uh, the town had to be evacuated. And it was a real, uh, it was a pretty, pretty awful situation. And he denied any kind of culpability or responsibility, but that was his, his style. CP, Canadian Pacific, um, used to own the, the line going through Lac Megantic but they sold it in the mid-90s. They were allowed to sell it. Uh, and eventually, Ed Burkhart uh, 
bought it. And uh, as I said, he, you know, if it was originally it was not uh, oil that came along later in 2011, 2012. Before that, it was forest products, etc. And it, it, it uh, he, he, you know, he cut, he cut. Uh, 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 employment by about 50 percent between 2001 and 2010. Uh, so you can you can see this at work. He had a terrible safety record. Uh, he was really was a delinquent operator, and uh, he wasn't cooperative uh, with with the regulator. So I'm just kind of painting the picture of Ed Burkhart uh, at uh, at uh, Montreal, Maine, and Atlantic. There were also in place, um, I talked a bit about the erosion of safety precautions, the changes to regulatory policy uh, in prior to, to the disaster. And they went uh, for a, a quite a long period of time, but they reached their peak uh, with, uh, with the Stephen Harper conservative government, who's a really a hardline conservative. He was also from the, the Petro state of Alberta, so his main uh, and the, by the way, the oil industries are, like the rail industries, are highly integrated. I mean, CN is the controlling sh uh, shareholder in Canadian National is Bill Gates. Uh, so just to give you a sense, and, and, and then at the time, CP, the controlling shareholder, uh, was Bill Ackman, and his, uh, his CEO was, uh, uh, was Hunter Harrison. So this is some of the, some of the policy changes. Uh, what I didn't put there was something called safety management system, which I won't go into, but was a was really kind of the 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 the, the epitome of self company self regulation, and then uh, uh, and then they brought in the one for one rule, and that's that's the rule that um, that basically says he was inspired by the his British counterparts. Basically, if you Propose if an agency proposes one regulation, they have to remove at least another. Uh, the Trump administration did a, a couple best because when they came into power, they brought in through executive order a regulatory policy that was three for one, and he says it's actually 22 for one. But well, that's that's what it is formally. Uh, so those regulatory policies were uh, uh, really. Um, uh, really s central to the story uh, and the erosion of, of precautions. And so you can see how the, rail, the, the oil by rail boom was peaking. It was peaking the same way in the U.S. It went from about 9,500 carloads in 2009 to about 415 or 410,000. Um, so uh, while this was all happening, while the danger was going, the rail and oil industry were blocking regulations to cope cope with that with that danger and I document how they were doing it both in public and through the lobbying process and the government was willfully blind because their uh, their priority was in Stephen Harper's words to create an energy superpower so there was oil coming from Alberta it was coming from uh, it was coming from North Dakota uh, and the companies were you know, often the same players. And then Irving buys and subcontracts to Montreal, Maine, and Atlantic. And it did that rather than going with Canadian National because it was it was a more dangerous air, um, railway, but it was more profitable this way, both for the company uh, Irving that was buying it and for CP, and they were focused on the profits. And it was it was becoming a very lucrative business. And so, so then it was, uh, and then MMA uh, uh, was was transporting it, but I also document the story of how it gained permission to operate these massive trains with a single operator, the first and only one in Canada to operate trains carrying dangerous goods with a same. A, a single operator, and it's a really uh, important story. And I know this is a question that Justin will talk about uh, because it's 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 uh, uh, it, it it is a raging issue right now uh, with the Trump administration uh, wanting to to uh, at a federal level uh, countering 
uh, uh, various actions at the state to prohibit it to uh, to bring in single person uh, single person trains. So I I it was uh, it's it 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 is a it, it's an appalling story uh, how it how it happened. The support from the the railway lobby, uh, the kind of the deference of the uh, of the regulator and so forth. Uh, and that's that's the train uh, that was going through the town of Lac Megantic, and it happened very quickly. By by the time they got permission for single person crews, and then they started uh, uh, transporting um, uh, oil. It was November uh, 2012, and the disaster happened eight months later in July uh, of 2013. So that's a that's a picture. I'm just going to. I'm going to read you some excerpts. I don't always do this, but I want to kind of connect you uh, with uh, with what happened on that night. Uh, it, it'll just be a few excerpts, but this is this gives you an idea of uh, of the sharpness of the curb, and it's a very steep slope. The last part of that curb is uh, is is equivalent to many in the in the Rockies so it's it's very steep and when the train ran away um, it uh, and it derailed in the town it was going at at, at over 60 miles an hour uh, it was a driverless train and I'll, I'll tell you uh, what, what will I do here um, yeah that's the picture of the um, of the um, the nightclub where most of the people died, uh, very close to the tracks. I just want to say a few words about the locomotive engineer. And it's one of the reasons I got started in doing this work. Uh, it ended up being a lot more, uh, but I, I I really noticed the ba the blame game going on right after it happened. No one taking responsibility, and they were blaming the last link in the chain was the locomotive engineer, and his name was was Tom Harding. So Tom Harding was working basically on his day off. Uh, they had cut so many people that there weren't, <laughs> weren't many people uh, to, uh, uh, to t you know, to take it on. So he did, agreed to work on his uh, on his day off. Um, he um, he uh, he had to. He said, "I have to." take some extra time. He was taking care of his uh, his elderly mother. Uh, so it left about two o'clock in the afternoon. Very shortly after the, he noticed, and he was told everything was fine with the train, uh, but he noticed that if the engine was kind of spitting and spewing oil and and lurching and and it, that was part of the problem uh, with this train. Uh, it was in addition to a track was which wasn't very good condition. Um, so um, he um, it took him a, almost ten and a half hours, a trip that would have taken normally four to five hours. He a, arrived at a town called Nantes, which is a, eleven kilometers away. What's that? Uh, six miles. Okay, um, and that's at the top of the hill. Uh, and that's where it sloped down. He had to park it at the top of the hill because the um, the siding was being rented out, and the siding would have had a derail device, which would have stopped an, an un, uh, a driverless train from a runaway train from running away. Uh, he couldn't park it on the flat because that would have crossed a road. Uh, he couldn't set the ha the air brakes on the. Uh, on the tank cars, on the 72 tank cars, because the company prohibited it for financial reasons. They warned him against setting too many handbrakes, and but he set the brake, uh, the air brake on the uh, on the locomotive. Uh, and the lead locomotive, as I said, it was uh, in in bad shape, smoking all the way. He asked what he should do to the to rail traffic controller. He, uh, he said, "We'll deal with it in the morning. Just let it be." So he he let let it go. Set a number of handbrakes, uh, and and the the other brake, and that held the train very well. But within minutes after he left, uh, the train uh, caught fire. That engine caught fire. The firefighters came, 
uh, very quickly, uh, and they put out the fire eventually. They tried a number of ways, and eventually they turned off the locomotive engine, uh, and that put the fire out. What they didn't re realize, nor should they have, they were firefighters, and that was per their instructions, uh, was that the, the air brake then started to, to leak. It was no longer holding uh, the train, or its likelihood was less and less. Uh, so the, they put the fire out. The rail traffic controller informed Tom Harding, who by this time was at his hotel. He'd already been awake for 17 and a half hours, uh, uh, so that, which is equivalent to being mildly, uh, uh, mildly drunk. Um, anyway, so he he came uh, to he came to his hotel. He was informed what happened. He said, "Perhaps I should go back and check it out." He said, "The rail traffic controller said." Never mind, Tom. Uh, I'm going to send someone, uh, and they'll look at the train. So just you got to work early in the morning and work rest rules, et cetera, et cetera. And so he did, he stayed there, uh, and they sent a track guy. But the track guy didn't understand the implications of turning off that important air brake holding the train. So about an hour after this was, uh, I think he was informed around uh, midnight. Uh, the track guy went there at 12.30 p.m. At 12.58, uh, enough air had leaked out that the train started to move. Uh, and about 15 minutes later, it derailed in the center of town. And, and the rest uh, is history. And I'm going to just read uh, uh, some excerpts. At 12.58 a.m., as the oil train began to roll, the crowds had thinned out at the music cafe. The band had taken a break. A few witnesses saw the ghostly train streaking across the countryside, gaining speed as it drew nearer to Lac Megantic. One of the firefighters who had attended the engine fire, his name was Jean-Luc Momigny, was returning home when he came to a level crossing about six kilometers from, the, from Lac Megantic. The red lights were flashing. I stopped my vehicle, he said. Then I asked myself questions because I did not hear a whistle, no engine. I went a little further to have good visibility. I did not see anything, so I thought it's a mistake. With the lights, I decided to cross. At that moment, the train appeared in front of my vehicle. It was traveling very fast. I assumed it was the same train we had been working on. He called 911. André Blais, who lived by the lake near the tracks, about a kilometer from the town center, he heard a loud rat -a tap as the train roared past. The slope, was, was, the slope was steepest at this point. Seconds later, at 1.14 a.m., the driverless train derailed at a curve in front of the St. Agnes Church in the heart of Lac Megantic. Almost immediately, said Blais, the explosions began. First, a series of small explosions, then two massive blasts and an orange mushroom cloud the beginning of a long apocalyptic night, a nightmare seared, seared forever in our memories. Gilles Fluet, who had left the music cafe a little earlier than usual, was walking home along the main street. He had just crossed the tracks when he saw the train hurtling toward him at high speed, then derail and explode. The train missed me by four feet, he said. The heat from the explosion melted the nine, from the train passing, melted the nylon fibers in his shirt deep into his skin. Inside the music cafe, there was a first vibration, like an earthquake, then another, this time more violent. People froze, not realizing what was happening. The power failed, the bar went black, and then was illuminated by a blinding orange light outside. Christian Lafontaine, who was at the back of the bar, reacted quickly, grabbing his wife, Melanie Guerard. He pulled her outside. She just wanted to hide. Everyone wanted to hide, Lafontaine recalled. There was no screaming, but with the orange light coming through the windows, many people mistakenly thought it was safer to stay inside the bar rather than to go outside. They were the last to leave the music cafe alive. 
The experience of Rémy Tremblay, the editor of the local weekly newspaper, The Echo de Frontenac, was captured in his article that he wrote shortly after. It was called, in English, it was called The Town of, of Souls in Pain. And I'll just read some excerpts. Awakened abruptly by my son Pierre in a panic. Quick, we have to evacuate. The town center is on fire. On automatic pilot, in panic mode, woke up my partner, Marie Duis, and the children, Felix and Maillet. We leave quickly. On the stairs, Pierre remembers his car keys are somewhere in the kitchen. In the dark, thank God, he finds them. Seconds of anguish, rapid departure. No one knows what's happening, but the sky is on fire. A chain of explosions and the sound of whistling gas escaping from everywhere. The vomiting bowels of hell. The scene was like the end of the world. Two and a half, two kilometers away, staff at the local hospital saw the flash and heard the explosion. They knew something terrible had happened. The hospital went into code orange and the staff quickly prepared for the expected onslaught of the injured. Staff from the surrounding med uh, medical centers rushed to help, but the hospital remained eerily quiet. A Red Cross volunteer voiced the dawning realization. You have to understand there are no wounded. They're all dead. The local parish priest, Father Steve LeMay, recalled, I went to the hospital to try to help with the wounded. We kept waiting, and the longer we waited, the more it became clear that there would be no injuries, only death. So that's about as much as I can handle myself for eating. Um, uh, but that that's... Uh, that's, uh, that'll give you a, a sense of, of what it was like that apocalyptic night. And that is one of many pictures of, of part of the wreckage the next day. Uh, and that's the disaster by the numbers. Uh, 47 people died, 26 children orphaned. Many of them were, were young people at, at the nightclub. 1.6 million gallons of back and oil spilled. It's the largest land-based spill in North American history. The worst modern disaster on Canadian soil in the last 100 years. Uh, Fritz and I in 2016 were that, that remembrance uh, in the town of Lap Megantic, we both spoke. That's a look at the town actually fairly recently. Uh, you see the church is and you see the town center, and now you see a big desert. It hasn't been rebuilt. It's still a big open, open field. So I'll just speak briefly about some of the cascading tragedies uh, when the cameras went away. Uh, the health, physical, self psychological trauma still affect more than half of the population with P PTSD. With young people, the the the, the uh, the studies have indicated that they're twice as likely to than the provincial average to want to think about committing suicide. Uh, they were exploited by ambulance chasers. Uh, Willie Garcia came up from Texas, uh, someone who is very knowledgeable about how to uh, exploit the situations of disasters and vulnerable victims' families. He had a law firm, but he wasn't a lawyer but he was very persuasive. Very shortly after, he got 41 of the 47 families uh, in, a, in a room, told them that they would get justice uh, because the wrongful death laws were much stronger in the US than they were in Canada, and that they had to go with him and he'd get justice for them, except that he wasn't a lawyer. And so he was basically got a finder's fee, passed it over to the wrongful death lawyers, pocketed about $15 million. Uh, and, and I'm very critical of the Quebec Bar Association who wasn't there to defend these vulnerable families. Um, they were also, if anybody's read Naomi Klein's book, uh, The Shock Doctrine, they were also the disaster capitalists because there was money for, be, for rebuilding. And they persuaded the town center that, or the, t the municipal council, that what they had to do was just raise the town, uh, including uh, buildings that they said were contaminated, even though studies had shown that most of them weren't contaminated. There were actually more 
buildings destroyed by that process than by the fire itself. Um, and so that's, that's, and, and that's caused a lot of tension in the community and, and, and a lot of division, but it's also a story and, and I've come to know uh, people in the community and it, there are stories of great tenacity and courage and uh, determined to, to prevail and pursue justice for their community and for all communities. Uh, and, but to ensure that, uh, that, uh, that, that there is, that the rail going through, uh, the dangerous goods going through their communities and they, they rebuilt that line very quickly. And, um, and you know, not that long after they started hauling dangerous goods, they're not, haul, haul, it's not unit oil trains, but you know, I've been there and I wake up, I, I get woken up uh, just like that as a start at five o'clock in the morning by this screeching whistle. And these people have to deal with that. Uh, and they finally um, uh, achieved a, um, a commitment from the government to, to build a, a bypass around the town. But that won't be built until at least 2023. That's 10 years after uh, it happened. Uh, I, I'll, I'm, I think my time's getting a bit short. Um, so I'll just, uh, you know, regulatory capture is an, is an important theme in my book. Uh, it's, it's about the power of, of the regulated industry over the regulator. And, and as, I, as I say, it, it goes hand in hand with the uh, dysfunctional and, and uh, deregulate and def deferential regulator. There, there are many elements to regulatory capture, which I talk about in the book. One that maybe you're uh, familiar with because it happened at Wall Street in 2008, 2009 is the, is the, um, the revolving door phenomenon. Um, uh, so it, we can we can elaborate that. Uh, yeah. So the the psychological capture is dimension of it is a, uh, an inspector who knows that it's not a good thing if he issues an order uh, on 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 a company for some safety violation or whatever because he's judged on the orders he doesn't. Uh, so he gets gets gun shy, and so you know that's that's uh, that, those are some of the elements of, uh, um, and these are some examples of where regulatory capture uh, is has has been a factor. And uh, you're probably most familiar with the the congressional inquiry these days that's going into Boeing and the 737 Max, and it's a it's it's a it's an appalling story. Of regulatory capture and 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 a regulator that was, uh, to use a railway m metaphor, asleep at the switch. Uh, so, uh, Deepwater Horizon um, in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, and in Britain, the Renf the Grenfell Tower fire uh, is is another example. They had a, a two for one rule, and and the the information the the. Uh, investigation so far has pointed to a lot of a number of elements that they were allowed to do in the construction of that building. Um, in the aftermath, crisis of confidence at the transport of department, there was a panic situation. Within days, they had prohibited single-person trains. I told you about the blame game, and then they brought in uh, a, a flurry of, uh, of of safety measures. But during that three-month period. The intensity of the lobbying from the railroad industry was more in, it was was more intense than at any previous period in the in in the previous five years. So that what they were doing was they were in lobbying, urging uh, the government to you know to go easy, to reverse, to dilute, to to block, and so forth. Um, and I got this from the lobbying records, of course. Uh, so there were a number of things, as I said, uh, the prohibition of single person train. Uh, we're gonna talk about tank car designs. So Justin will talk about, I just asked questions about this uh, because they brought in a new design model for the tank car. Uh, it's, uh, it ain't fixed the problem. Uh, there are still derailments, spills, 
and explosions in some cases, in some cases just spills. There are real problems with the train securement rule. There was a, a runaway train in the Rocky Mountains. Uh, three uh, uh, employees were killed in that. That was a, that was a, a secure securement program. F fatigue management, uh, there was the CN strike, uh, the Canadian national strike just, just recently. The main issue was fatigue management. Fatigue management is an issue throughout uh, the industry, and it's one that, you know, even it's on the, the Transportation Safety Board watch list. Uh, there have been warnings, and yet they're, you know, they continue, continue to push back. Uh, so where does the buck stop? Uh, three frontline workers uh, were subjected to a criminal trial. Uh, I went to that uh, trial. I attended a number of the sessions, as did Fritz. Um, uh, they were acquitted. Uh, no executive or owner was charged. No one was held accountable in the industry. The, the railway lobby, who once they lobbied hard to get single person trade, they lobbied to allow this delinquent railway to be the first to get permission. Uh, and the governments uh, have, both the Harper government and now the current government, have refused to hold anything beyond the Transportation Safety Board report, and I devote a whole chapter to, 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 to showing how inadequate that was in terms of answering fundamental uh, questions and that there should be a need. And just the example of the congressional hearing uh, is one that, you know, I will go back to and, and, you know, push the government again to kind of change its mind. We have a minority government now, so it means that the committees have more, more power. Uh, and that's that's uh, that's a classic perp walk. They were walked in to the courtroom like this, and this was done as a PR. Tom Harding, who's the front person there, he was uh, SWAT team came in. He was working uh, with his kids outside. Uh, SWAT team came in. They kind of held them to the ground, brought them in, and you know I think they were doing a PR um, uh, to to show the community that justice was being served and they found the culprits. And someone yelled out in the crowd, it was very quiet, someone yelled, the right people aren't there. And I think that sentiment was, uh, was held by everyone. Um, so just, uh, just to give you a sense of the, of the present, and Justin will talk, talk to you about the current situation in the US and, and, uh, and, in, and in this community. But record volumes are moving by rail. Uh, and there's been an increase in accidents. I know from in Canada from 2016 to 2018, a 25% increase. Here are some of the recent uh, derail recent derailments. With all the changes and the stronger cars, they were all with the stronger bottle of cars. And M Mosier, it was back in shale. It was a fire in Iowa. It was diluted bitumen from Alberta. No fire in Manitoba, Saint Lazar. Uh, diluted bitumen, no fire. And then there was uh, Fort Worth, Texas in April was uh, ethanol, yeah. And then in Saskatchewan very recently it was bitumen and there was a fire. So major safety risks remain in all of the areas that I mentioned. Uh, and uh, Justin will elaborate. 80% um, of Canadian oil production is exported on almost all of it to the U.S. And 8 to 10% uh, now goes by rail. Uh, about 20% of Canada imports uh, also imports about 20% of that. Two thirds uh, comes from the U.S. So it's going it's going back and forth. Um, uh, so you can see between 2013 and 2018 how imports as a percentage of uh, it, of total rail traffic, oil by rail traffic has increased. Uh, and uh, you can see, get a, a sense of, of, uh, of what they were in July of 2013 uh, and, uh, and uh, what they are, the, the latest figures show. So uh, depends where you sit, depends who you are. In, in a way they, they have, uh, no one's been held accountable. Uh, a lot of the defendants have had to pay fines and civil actions, and there have been some lesser, lesser uh, sentences. 
Tom Harding was the only person who had to um, serve a, a, what's it called, a, a sentence, but away from prison, um, community, community uh, sentence. Uh, but, but one of the reasons I wrote the book uh, was because when the cameras go away, uh, people forget what happened and why and what the causes were, and it just kind of faints into a kind of nostalgia, right? And then it happens again. Uh, and so let's not forget Lac Megantic. So thank you. Uh, that's just give you a sense of where you can get the book. Um, thank you very much. Anyways, a cautionary tale indeed. Um, you have my head spinning, I'm sure everyone's uh, head spinning, so many uh, different past uh, questions we will have for you, but clearly um, a cautionary tale and one that I know Justin is going to bring home to us here uh, in Burton County, uh, in New Jersey, in the Northeast, and one so many lessons are from. So we'll uh, ask you questions af after Justin, and Justin and I turn it over to you. Thank you. All right. All right. Can you guys hear? Yes. OK. Uh, thanks, Bruce. Uh, I highly recommend getting Bruce's book. It's, uh, it's a, not, not a fun read, but it's very compelling. Uh, I learned a lot, even though I've spent the last six years focusing on this. So my book is called Bomb Trains. Uh, and as I say, in a sane world, I'd be talking to you about how we learned about what happened in Loch Megantic and how uh, we've used the science and those learnings to solve those problems, which uh, is possible to do, should have been done. Uh, unfortunately, that is not what I'll be talking about today. So this is a quote you should keep in mind uh, as I go through you know, this, this whole presentation. This is a quote, I don't know whether you can see it. It's Sarah Feinberg was the, uh, the administrator of the Federal Railroad Administration, which is the main regulatory agency in the US uh, for rail. Uh, she was talking here specifically about uh, the regulation to uh, require modern brakes on these, these trains. The braking system that uh, Bruce described was originally designed in 1860. Um, and so what, what she was saying is the science is there, the data is there. Their argument is despite the data, they don't want to spend the money on it. And so to put this in perspective, she, they is the rail companies. There's a, a wealth of science, decades of research saying these modern brakes work better than the ones designed in 1860, which isn't hard to, to uh, figure out. But this is the top regulator for the rail industry in the United States saying, but they don't want to do it. And so it hasn't happened. And so that's where our regulatory system is at. It's all about, they don't want to spend the money. We know it's the right thing to do. Rail companies send, say they don't want to spend the money and the head of the FRA can't make them. So unfortunately, there are a lot of current issues about this. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about current issues about oil by rail, uh, some of the major risks with moving oil, ethanol, and unfortunately now LNG, which is liquefied natural gas by rail, uh, and talk a little bit about uh, in this failed regulatory environment, what we can do, what uh, individuals can do to try to uh, force some sort of change. I know Bruce talked about this, but just to put this in perspective, this is uh, a graph of US oil by rail volume. And you can see I have Lac Megantic on there in 2013. This all came uh, around because of fracking. Uh, all of a sudden, they were producing a lot of oil in North Dakota, and there were no pipelines. And so they very quickly, there were no regulations to stop them from doing this. They just built, there's nothing in North Dakota, so it's easy to build these massive, uh, these loading stations. And they started putting in trains. Uh, and, you know, Lac Megantic was the first accident in 2013 when the volumes really ramped up. There were three more in the next six months, uh, you know, several, like eight or, eight or ten during that big peak. Uh, they've continued, but um, thankfully the price of oil went down um, and it was cheaper for the people on the East Coast who are buying this North Dakota oil to buy African oil uh, by tanker. And that's why the volumes in the U.S. really dropped down, although they continued to move Bakken oil to the West Coast. Uh, and Bruce mentioned one of those accidents was in Oregon a couple of years ago. What we're facing right now is Canada uh, has been ramping up oil by rail. And so uh, while Lac Megantic was happening, you know, that was U.S. oil. Uh, the, the real risk right now is Canadian oil. Uh, and you can see at the, the end of 2019 or 2018, 
Uh, they hit a new record of 350 barrels per day. Uh, it's not in this data set right here, but in December of this year, so December 2019, uh, that was up to 500,000 barrels a day, and that should be the expected volume uh, on average across the next year. So as we saw in the US, as, and it just makes sense, we get higher volumes, you're more likely to have accidents. Uh, there are going to be, uh, I can guarantee, there are going to be Canadian oil by rail accidents this year. Of course, that Canadian, all this oil is coming to America. It's mostly going to the Gulf Coast, the West Coast at this point. Uh, but so those accidents will be happening in Canada and in the US. This is a quote from a big invest, investor last October just saying there's big motivation to increase oil by rail use. Uh, it's underused. Uh, so, and that's, that's playing out right now. There, a lot more of this is coming. Uh, ethanol by ethanol is a there's a fixed amount you can see it's pretty much been uh, you know steady across the the uh, the last decade the amount they move but the the reason the risk with ethanol has increased is they've started to mimic what the oil trains do which is much longer trains all of ethanol uh, and that's what we've seen with these accidents like the one in Texas was a long train of ethanol that uh, spilled and caught fire. Uh, and here's just an image of that. That was uh, April, uh, get the glasses on. Uh, that was this, this past April uh, where this happened. Uh, luckily, um, a, a recurring theme with these accidents uh, afterwards is people say, we were very lucky. A lot of them have happened very close to residential areas. Lac Megantic was the one where it was in the middle of town. But this again, it killed some horses, but you know, had to evacuate the local town, but no, no people were killed. So some of the current issues that we're facing, um, we, Bruce talked a lot about one person versus two person crews. So I'm gonna talk about Illinois uh, and that issue right now. Washington state is trying to limit the volatility of this oil that is moved by rail. And the reason we, we call them bomb trains is because the oil is so volatile and explosive. And then I'll be speaking about LNG by rail. So um, as you know, Bruce talked about, it's important to have two person crews uh, and in the, the, this headline here, uh, just a couple months ago, the, the state of Illinois uh, signed a law saying you're going to have to have two-person crews if you want to move this through our state, uh, even though the feds have said that's not, shouldn't be the case. Um, and so what happened was at the end of the Obama administration, they proposed a regulation saying we definitely on these oil trains and ethanol trains, we want to have two-person crews. Uh, the, the regulatory system was broken during the Obama administration. It's gotten far worse during the Trump administration. Uh, and so when the Trump administration came in, they said, uh, I think as Bruce mentioned, uh, we're just going to, we're not even going to consider that regulation. You don't need two person crews. The, the, the more important part of that uh, decision was, uh, and this happened in this past year, the FRA is the Federal Railroad Administration. But in, their, in the, the, the explanation of why they were withdrawing the, uh, saying you didn't need two-person crews, what they also said was states like Illinois, and there are 10 other states who have regulations in the state requiring a two-person crew, they're saying the federal, if the federal government says no, the two-person crews aren't allowed, you as a state can't require it. It's, you know, it will have a preemptive effect. And so this is, uh, you know, certainly problematic. It's, it's taking away the state's rights to protect their own citizens. But even worse, in my opinion, in that buried in that uh, decision explanation was DOT, which is Department of Transportation, which is the, the, the bigger oversight body. The new approach to achieving safety is removing unnecessary barriers and issuing voluntary guidance rather than regulation. So essentially said the policy at the Department of Transportation now is to remove regulations, uh, which uh, that you know happened in the past year, and uh, believe them because that's what they're doing. Uh, so, um, in Washington State, so that that was two-person crews. Uh, Washington State had said if you're going to bring this oil into our state, you have to reduce the volatility so it's not as explosive. Uh, it's something called vapor pressure is the way they measure it, and they say. We want it to be nine pounds per square inch. That's the, the, the guideline. Um, and um, so there's this another battle going on within the states. North Dakota and Mon Montana, where the Bakken oil is produced, 
Uh, and all this happens with attorney generals or attorneys general. Uh, so in North Dakota, Montana, they're saying, well, we're not gonna let that stand. So this is another legal battle being set up uh, about should this dangerous volatile oil be allowed to be moved by rail? Uh, and so the situation we're in right now with these, these issues, there will be lawsuits, um, and this is gonna be really important because uh, if we have an administration in place at the federal level, like we do now, that believes their job is to remove regulations, the states are the only ones who can protect the public. Uh, and so this is gonna be a big battle about states' rights uh, do, do you have the right to protect your citizens or does the federal government have that preemptive effect that they claim they do? So um, again, this is something to be aware of. Uh, New Jersey has signed on to several of these lawsuits, uh, the New, Jer New Jersey AG, uh, but this is gonna be an important, um, if, this, if, if this, uh, the states lose, uh, it's really going to uh, have a negative uh, impact on safety. Uh, let me just skip ahead one more. Oh, and that gets you know, the issue of uh, LNG by rail and, and um, liquefied natural gas has not been moved by rail in in the U.S. Um, in and in April of last year, uh, which is a very unusual move, uh, President Trump actually issued an executive order saying, "I want." LNG by rail to be uh, regu allowed by regulations within a year. So that would be basically this April or May. Um, so that was uh, last April. Um, the public comment period for that regulation, where you could say, I, I support this or uh, oppose it, ended on Tuesday. Um, this week, 15 states, uh, again, the attorneys general, signed on and said, this is crazy, we shouldn't be doing this. Uh, and New Jersey, again, was one of those states. But so this is a real, this is something, you know, a lot of this has been going back and forth this week. Uh, and uh, you in New Jersey and Pennsylvania actually are the guinea pigs for this because even though uh, the actual nationwide regulation isn't in place, the Trump administration approved a special permit uh, that will allow a company to take uh, liquefied natural gas by train to uh, southern New Jersey. Uh, and so this is going to, you know, it's a test case for this, but uh, that's going to be happening. Um, New Jersey really doesn't have a lot of the risk because most of it's coming through Pennsylvania. But uh, so, th but th this is happening. And if we look at, uh, you, I mean, you saw the pictures that Bruce and described what happened to Lock Magantic. Uh, if that was liquefied natural gas, the damage would have been uh, many times greater. This is a highly, dangerous and explosive material. And don't trust me on that. Uh, this is a quote from the National Transportation Safety Board, uh, which is a federally appointed board uh, that is supposed to protect the public and advise on these issues. And so the, although the current administration is saying we want to put this forward, the NTSB is saying we believe that risks of catastrophic LNG releases and accidents are too great. So the, the, the the body that is supposed to advise on what is safe and not safe is saying, do not do this, uh, it's far too risky. Uh, so that's, um, you know, that's, that's an issue that we're facing right now. Um, I do believe that it will be approved in the next couple months. Uh, and uh, while the special permit is going to, it's allowed right now in New Jersey, in Southern New Jersey, if this is approved uh, with all of the frack natural gas glut that we have in this country, there is the potential for a lot of these trains to be moving through communities like this. Uh, to talk about some of the ongoing risks, the reason these uh, trains were called bomb trains, like the one that went through Lac Megantic, uh, is because that the, the fracked oil coming out of the ground in North Dakota and in Texas and uh, across the country uh, contains a lot of natural gas liquids, which are things like propane and butane. Uh, these liquids can be removed by a process called stabilization, which would make the oil essentially safe. It wouldn't explode like it did in Lock Magantic and in many other accidents. Um, and when, when Lock Magantic happened, the articles that first came out uh, were all saying, well, there are oil company executives saying crude oil doesn't explode like that. 
something else had to have happened. Maybe they hit some like propane storage in downtown Lock Megantic. Something caused that, it couldn't have been crude oil. Um, what we know now is that it was propane and butane, but that was actually in the tank cars mixed in with the oil. Um, and now the industry admits that and said, yes, that's, that's in there, but we're not gonna take it out because it actually makes it more valuable. Uh, the refineries will pay more for it if you have the butane and propane in it. So getting back, you know, kind of like to that first quote about they, they know what to do, they just don't wanna pay for it. And so again, that's what we're dealing with here. Uh, so these, these trains that continue to run still have this volatile oil. We know what the problem is, we know what the solution is. They simply, it would cut into profits so they won't do it. Uh, and so this is really the, the heart of that fight happening in Washington State. Um, that also that the, that the, the AG of New Jersey is supporting. Um, North Dakota, as I, I mentioned earlier, uh, is fighting this and um, citing a federal study, which uh, I've read and is very flawed. Um, but North Dakota is saying, really, Washington State doesn't have any grounds to do this because, um, as their attorney general says, the Bakken oil is no different than any other kind of oil with respect to volatility. So that's the argument being made by an attorney general, and it's, it's a complete lie. There's absolutely no scientific basis for that. And so the, uh, that's, that's what a lot of this is about. Um, it's the oil industry just saying, uh, this isn't a problem. And they're so powerful uh, as lobbyists, they've been able to get away with it now for, um, six years since Lac Megantic. Uh, again, this has been a big week for these issues. Uh, Washington State is fighting ab about this issue about the volatility of the oil. Just this week, a California uh, congressman introduced a new bill uh, basically requiring the same thing. So uh, this is um, an area, one of the things about the, the complex nature of the regulatory system in the US which makes it easy to manipulate uh, is that there you have your regulators who can make rules, but then Congress can also make rules. So uh, there is this new this new bill, which would be fantastic. This is uh, this could really reduce the risk of these trains in derailment situations. Uh, and so this is the bill is uh, from uh, Representative Garamendi from uh, California. You know, making the case that you know, if we do this, we certainly could save lives um, by decreasing volatility. Uh, but also, him saying that uh, he's going to make it part of the surface transportation re reauthorization, and this is how a lot of uh, regulations happen. Um, they can be put in place or removed this way. They just bury them in a 4,000-page bill, like the Surface Transportation Reauthoriz Reauthorization Act. Um, I'm not optimistic that, I mean, clearly the oil company lobbyists are well aware of this. Uh, I don't think it will make it through the final version of the bill, uh, but there's no reason why we shouldn't be talking to our Congress people and uh, recommending that they support this. So that's the issue of the, the, the American oil, the volatility, uh, but the Canadian oil also is volatile uh, for different reasons. The tar sands that, um, is, is like a, it's a thick paste. And so to get, to be able to put that into tank cars, they mix it with a highly volatile uh, condensate, which is like a very light oil, often coming out of these fracked oil fields, being shipped from the US to Alberta, mixed with the bitumen, and then shipped back through the US. Um, as I mentioned, there are record amounts of this headed to the US. Uh, and th this is an example of what happens when one of those trains, it's very similar to what happens with Bakken oil trains. Uh, this was in Gogama, uh, Ontario. This is one image. These people had the unlucky experience. Three weeks later, another train did the exact same thing. <laughs> so uh, thankfully it was outside of town, but that's their river. Um, both of, the, both of the, the accidents, the trains went into the river that spilled, I believe, 750,000 gallons between the two. Uh, so the risk is very real for this. And as I mentioned, a huge increase of this oil is coming to America right now. I mentioned earlier that there was a record amount of Canadian oil that came in December, 500,000 gallons a day. 
this is one, an accident that happened in December. So just as we saw when the Bakken oil really ramped up in volumes, we got a bunch of accidents. Just it's, it's simple, simple math that makes sense. You put more trains on the tracks, higher incidence of derailments. Uh, this one, I believe it spilled 400,000 gallons of oil. Again, a major oil spill. And with all of these, they normally just burn for days. They let them burn out. Uh, Bruce mentioned, you know, this is another issue, the, the, the tank cars. Uh, the tank cars that were used in Loch Megantic were originally designed to, to move molasses and corn oil. The, the NTSB, the National Transportation Safety Board, had been warning since 1990 to not put flammable liquids in these tank cars. Uh, but when the, the Bakken oil started, they had all this oil, they needed tank cars to put it in. So they took these tank cars that they'd been told not to use for flammable liquids uh, and started moving them in these long trains. We now know those failed uh, horribly in the accident. After several years of regulations in the US, we have these new, what are we're, we're told are safe tank cars. Uh, they're these two different types of cars, the 117s, the 1232s. There have now been four derailments with these, uh, three of them oil trains, one ethanol. You saw the pictures of the burning ethanol train. Uh, you saw the, the picture of the burning uh, train in Saskatchewan. Uh, so the reality is, uh, here we are six or seven years later, uh, lots of new regulations in place, and the rail industry, and mostly the oil industry, was able to water down the regulations. There are safe tank cars. You could put this oil in tank cars, and it would be much, much safer. They just, again, do not want to pay for it. Uh, so, um, this is an example of one of those. Uh, this was in Iowa, it was Canadian oil. All the new tank cars spilled almost a quarter million gallons. If you're gonna crash one of these trains, it's best to crash them directly into a river because then they don't catch on fire. Uh, so that's the tank cars, that's another real risk. Uh, if you see an oil train right now, um, it's, it's using tank cars that have failed in every known accident. Uh, another issue is the modern brakes. Uh, I mentioned that earlier. This was the one real regulation that was put in place in 2015. Uh, and uh, I was surprised, uh, but uh, very happy uh, when I learned that they actually uh, got this through. Uh, shortly after that, I was in uh, at a conference in Washington, DC, where several hundred, you know, probably 500 people come together. A lot of the big CEOs from the energy industry are there. Uh, and that year, oil by rail was very big. So the CEO of BNSF was there uh, he, and he stood in front of the whole audience and they said, what do you think of these new regulations? I said, I, we're, we're good with them, but except for the breaking one, we're gonna have to change that. Um, and so this was weeks after they had just announced these new regulations. Uh, I still was a bit naive at that point. I was like, I, I didn't know you could do that. Uh, you can when you're the CEO of BNSF. The FRA repealed that uh, in 2017 by going through Congress. They, they got a new study that was a complete sham there's decades worth of research showing these modern brakes are much better, but this was the one real safety regulation. Uh, and the, the rail company just said, I, well, I don't want it. And, and so they, they repealed it. Bruce mentioned Boeing. There's a, a, almost an identical quote from the CEO of Boeing uh, where he said, uh, you know, someone said, well, the regulators are gonna make us, you know, make the plane safe. And he said, we're, we're not gonna accept that and, you know, Two of them dropped out of the sky. So uh, we have a very failed regulatory system in this country and in Canada. Uh, you know, I followed this now for six years, sat through numerous congressional hearings, NTSB hearings. Uh, I've read all of these documents, uh, but and 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 really learned about the whole process. But one of the things I've learned is the regulators, the people at the FRA at a FIMSA. Uh, they don't make the rules. Um, they really are not, the, they don't have the final say. When the regulations came out in, in 2015, there were comments from people, the regula actually they weren't actually the regulators at the time, they were the former head of those regulatory agencies and they said, I was really surprised the regulations weren't tougher. So the, the people who are in charge supposedly of making the rules we're surprised by the actual rules. So clearly they're not the ones who have the final say. Uh, another very flawed process or part of this process is at every congressional hearing, at every meeting, any public event, 
the people at the head of the table are represent the American Petroleum Institute uh, and the Association of American Railroads. And they're deferred to, it's, it's amazing to watch that the regulators will ask the Amer head of the, or the American Petroleum Institute, well, what do you think we should do? Uh, that's why we have these dangerous trains. Uh, and then there's this final step where the regulations, the regulators hand them off to an office in the White House where the Office of uh, Information and Regulatory Affairs, where there are secret private meetings. Uh, all we know is who attends them. We don't know what is said. Uh, occasionally we'll get a PowerPoint slide. Um, but uh, so in the instance of the, the oil by rail regulations, there was a meeting between the, the person of uh, the head of OIRA uh, and the top lawyer for BNSF, which was the top oil by rail company. So those two guys got in a room and hammered out what they thought was an acceptable regulation, um, it, which is why we do not have real safety regulations in this country. The, the corporations are controlling it at every step of the way. The one area, as, as I mentioned earlier, that Congressman from uh, California has now proposed new safety regulations about the volatility of the oil, Congress does have some power over this process. Unfortunately, most of Congress is also owned by the oil and rail companies. So, uh, but uh, I know my congressman, my congressman is, is hopeless in this area. If you do have Congress people who uh, are, are conscientious and care about these things, it's really important to educate them about that they have a lot of stuff going on. So uh, I would recommend uh, letting your Congress people know about uh, this new proposed safety regulation and. Uh, you know, these things can make it through, but they need a lot of support because the lobbyists are paid a lot of money to make sure they don't make it through. So this is uh, a quote. Yeah, I, again, I've, I've, I've sat through a lot of congressional hearings on these issues. So the quote, I, I was shocked when I heard it. Um, this is Congresswoman Jackie Spire from California. PHMSA is the division of the Federal Railroad Administration that actually makes the regulations regarding oil trains. Um, uh, but this was her take on it. The system is fundamentally broken. Uh, it's a, you know, calling the, the regulatory agency an industry pet that frightens absolutely no one. Uh, and no one in DC reported on this. It was just, it was a shrug. I was the only person who actually reported on this. But this is the reality of, we have people in Congress saying the regulatory system, you know, it, it is controlled by industry. It is an industry pet. The only thing that has made us safer in any way has been uh, activism or public outcry. Uh, this is a quote from a book. Uh, the, the rail industry has a long history of killing people for, uh, you know, making, using unsafe trains uh, to get higher profits. Uh, but so even back in, in the 1880s when a lot of people were dying in trains, uh, the only way there was regulations with the public finally said this is enough. Um, actually, one of the things that really spurred re regulation was a bunch of uh, New York politicians were traveling between uh, the city and Albany, and they all died in a, tra in a train accident. And then, you know, people finally said, oh, we got to do something about this. Um, activism has worked. Uh, it's the only thing that has worked. So the trains that are on the tracks are not safe. Uh, these LNG trains that are coming are insane, uh, highly dangerous. Um, and yeah, I want to make a point about LNG versus, uh, versus crude oil. Crude oil could be made safe. Uh, I, I'm confident we, know we have the, the, the understanding of the oil, the tank cars, we put the, using modern brakes. We could make it pretty safe to move by rail. LNG, if, there's no way to make that safe. It's, it's a highly dangerous uh, explosive material. If they crash one of these LNG trains, it's going to make Loch Megantic look like uh, uh, just a, a footnote in the history of rail disasters. Um, but uh, what has worked um, has been communities blocking uh, infrastructure. So uh, a lot on the West Coast, uh, Bruce mentioned Baltimore earlier. Baltimore did this. They wanted to build a new oil by rail facility in Baltimore. You guys in New Jersey should be thankful what they did because those trains would have been coming through New Jersey most likely. Uh, and so they did, I had a municipal, you know, the, the city of Baltimore said, we're not gonna allow any new oil infrastructure to be built in our city. 
it passed and they were so the the rail company was un unable to bring oil trains there they've done that on several city uh cities on the west coast uh and that's keeping these dangerous trains off the tracks and so that is a form of act that's one of the main ways that people have been able to uh improve safety uh congressional representatives as i mentioned they do have some power in this they need to be pressured and supported and educated uh but um, from, a, from a standpoint of what we can do, um, unfortunately, the system is very broken, uh, but the, the activism really has been the only thing that has made any difference. Uh, and I like to try to end on a positive note. Um, all of this is about profit and greed. The people running the oil and rail companies only care about profit. They, they, they do not care about safety. The biggest oil by rail company is BNSF. It's owned by Warren Buffett, who owns a good chunk of this country, um, but he only cares about money. And so here's an example of, he also owns these large utility companies out west. They're closing down the coal uh, power plants in the next couple of years because they're too expensive. They're not using natural gas, they're going right to renewables. Uh, and so this is a real, you know, here's a guy who's been making a lot of money off of oil by rail. He only cares about profit and what works. and. I write about a lot for DSMOG, I write about the fracking industry, and this is one of the few things that gives me hope right now, is that renewables are cheaper than coal, and they're also uh, very quickly going to be cheaper than natural gas, uh, and uh, so that is something, the, the main way we can uh, make sure, especially with LNG, uh, is just to keep the stuff in the ground uh, and move to renewables, uh, because really with LNG, there's never going to be a safe way to move it by rail. And I think that's it for me. Thank you so much, Dustin. Um, Bruce, I would invite you back up here to join us. And um, so many important points, important things. I, I, while well, Bruce is coming up here, I, I wonder, do you know, happen to know the bill number off by hand or you don't? Okay. We will maybe find that out and get that out to everyone because that would be important for us to be able to offer that up. Um, and uh, one point that I, I didn't hear you both raise and before I oh, just open it up to questions, what, one of the um, issues that seems to have pulled our bill here in the state maybe was this issue of we have to keep security we can't let uh people know what's coming through where in fact it, as part of the bill was important that uh safety people in the towns know that what's coming so if there is an accident we can fight it so can you talk a little bit um to that Am I on here? hello uh yeah that's been a the the rail industry has um always gone back and said these are uh, security issues, they talk about terrorism, um, and and say that's why we can't tell you. Because the you know, question anyone wants to know is how many of these trains are coming through my community? Uh, what's in them? Uh, and uh, they've always said, uh, no, this is security sensitive information. Um, I actually FOIA'd some, I got documents from the state of Washington uh, and got some of the letters from BNSF where they, they were claiming, no, we can't give you the information. Uh, it's, it's, it's secure, it's sensitive. Uh, but then when, when you ask the, the, the TSA and the actual agencies who classify things, it's like, they said, no, it isn't. <laughs> so the rail companies just made that up uh, and they get away with it. Uh, but the other thing with that issue is, uh, when this was uh, a big issue in New York, um, probably five years ago, uh, a New York uh, politician made a, a good point He's saying, well, you know, if terrorists want to know how many of these trains are, are on the tracks and when they're coming through, all they need is a window and a watch. Uh, you know, it's, anyone who lives near the tracks is well aware of uh, how often these come by and when. So, um, again, that's a, it, it's, a, it's really a, a false argument. The main reason why they don't want to know is because it's uh, tradable information for investors. That's, that's the only reason. So if, if we know, all right, BNSF is using, you know, they're now moving 50 trains through, you know, North Dakota on this day, then, you know, this is what uh, the oil industry has come down to from an investment standpoint. They use satellites to track how many new wells, you know, so that's their reasoning. It's, it's purely business, uh, you know, a competitive edge. It has nothing to do with safety. Well, our legislators Can need I, to hear that. Absolutely, just, uh, yes. 
Your Honor. Am I on? Am I on? Yes. Yeah. Um, just to add, um, uh, yeah, both on the security issue, it, it, it operates. It operates the same way. I mean, as I, as I've already said, it's it's a highly integrated industry, and there the way they lobby is and and the re, and and the relationship with the regulator is is also high, highly re regulated, um, and. Uh, and so they, whether it's security or commercial confidentiality, they succeed, uh, and and I think there need to be major improvements on our, our access or freedom of information years as well to to because I think that kind of that kind of sunshine, uh, you know, is empowering uh, for the public for activists. I can tell you, my friends in Lac Megantic, the activists in Lac Megantic, are very knowledgeable about the dangerous goods that are running through their town. They understand what the UN system of placarding is. Uh, they know uh, when propane or ethanol or whatever, uh, and I'm told they have cameras positioned. Uh, uh, they have to be positioned very carefully because they're close to private property, right? And the, and the rail the rail companies really guard their private property. So at any time there's a big disaster, you know, they. They just block every everybody from uh, uh, you know from getting access to it. I think it was in the, the Manitoba one. The, the way they determined uh, the magnitude of that was was a drone. Mm. Uh, so yeah, so that's uh, um, and, and and they've been uh, my friends in Lac Megantic have, have been very successful in that regard. Good to, good to hear. Um, and I know uh, we've had many examples, too, of how our community is working to get that information out there. So I'm going to open the questions uh, to both of you from the audience. I would ask you uh, to formulate your, your statement, not as a statement, but as a question, because we are so fortunate to have these uh, two experts here with us, and we want to hear from them um, in the time that we have remaining. So, yes? Yeah, thank you. Oh. Yeah, I've, done. I've, I've studied this over a length of time myself, and uh, some of the comments were made were not directly aimed at preventing derailing. Derailing has to do with rails and wheels, and nothing here has been uh, mentioned, I think, to improve the quality of the rail and wheel connection and to see that it's monitored, because that would give a chance if uh, an axle is wearing down or if a rail is cracked or broken, that the management can say, well, we got a problem. Let's not bust up 2,000, uh, you know, a 200 car train, whether it's holding milk or holding uh, uh, oil. Yeah, unfortunately, um Bruce and I, you know, we both wrote whole books. We couldn't cover everything in the half an hour. So I completely agree with you. Most derailments uh, are because of track failures um, or wheel failures. Uh, and uh, uh, an important thing to note about that is a couple of people died a few years ago, somewhere near around Baltimore. I think uh, a coal train derailed uh, and two people were near the tracks and they were just buried in coal. Uh, and so, and it was a, a failed track. And so there was a real push right then to say, we need track inspections, we need regulations on how long uh, you can have rails before they're replaced. Uh, and so there was push by that. And um, there, was a, there was a quote by someone um, within the rail industry saying, it's no secret that the, the rail companies don't want to be regulated. Uh, and the rail companies very effectively shut that down. And so there are no regulations for how often you have to replace the tracks. Uh, and that's uh, clearly all of these, at Lock Megantic was, well, the tracks in Lock Megantic, I've been there, they're, they're horrifying to look at. They're in such horrible shape. Uh, but there, you know, the, that is a, what a lot of the, the oil by rail accidents, which I didn't talk about them all specifically, but uh, wheel failures, but track failures. Um, and uh, uh, you know another you know just stunning thing with this is in many of the accidents um, they had identified the tracks having flaws uh, and so they were supposedly on a schedule to fix them so there was a record where they said yes this track is we need to fix this 
and then one of these oil trains derailed. That happened uh, in West Virginia, that happened in Virginia, that happened in Illinois. Uh, so, um, you know, I, I believe in the, the Mosier, actually the accident happened in Mosier, Oregon. There, there were a couple things uh, related to that uh, as well. So, um, yes, we, we didn't get to talk about all the I issues here. That's certainly a big issue. Um, I would, um, and uh, as I said, the industry just refuses to be, to be regulated and they continue to roll back those regulations. Um, I'll just to add to, in, in, in the, the Lac-Megantic example, uh, in, the, in the lead up uh, to Lac-Megantic in those years where the oil by rail boom was, uh, was in full swing, um, I had mentioned the interaction of policies of deregulation, privatization, and austerity, because uh, starting in the really starting in the 80s and then uh, ramping up in the 90s, there so were major cuts, major cuts to the Department of Transportation in Canada. I suppose they were happening similarly uh, in, in Canada, and then they kind of uh, reached their, uh, you know, their. Uh, on steroids with 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 the Harper Conservative government, uh, and so in in just to give you an example in in the period um, uh, yes from 2009 to 2013 there was uh, in 2009 there was uh, one transportation of dangerous goods inspector uh, for every four, 14 carloads um, in in. Uh, Boy, I'm, I'm I'm missing the number, but it was extreme. In in uh, uh, in in 2013, it had ramped up to uh, something like 5,000, and I'm probably underestimating. I have to look in the book. I haven't thought about that statistic. So, but just to say that they, as this was happening, as the danger was growing, they were cutting the 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 budget for the rail safety division of Transport Canada was cut from 2009 to 2013 by almost 30 percent. So, you know, they were, and, and, and so there was, so they've got this self-regulation system in place, and any inspection, you know, the, the, the number of on-site unannounced inspections, whether, whether of the, from dangerous goods or from rail, uh, safety inspectors was, uh, you know, was, 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 was dropping, and it became a kind of a book entry. They were just monitoring what the companies were saying they were doing according to the regulations that they had put out. So that's uh, crazy. And one other thing with that, when they do, you know, get, they find that they, they weren't maintaining the track, or so, you know, how are they held accountable, right? So what is their incentive? Um, the fines that are, that they receive if they've done something wrong are so small that, um, what, one one of the people on the inside of the regulatory agency who deals with the companies and finds them said, uh, when we when we have one of these problems and we hold them accountable, you know they, they have to pay a fine, and it's so small that the the quote was they just cut the check and smile. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, we we see that with PIMSA with uh, with uh, pipelines, everything. The number of uh, people to inspect is, is minimal uh, or not e does it non-existent um, if you can raise your hand um, yes up here thank you hi there um, what I, I mean just general comment when I'm here one of the things that I was struck by when you were talking when you both were talking was um, that uh, it's one thing to get the regulations and you know to have some kind of congressional oversight the other aspect is enforcement and fines and you know that happens at all levels of government whether it's local state or whatever my um, concern as far as our local community and I've already talked to state legislators about this is the trains that, you know, New Jersey is, and especially this section of New Jersey is so densely populated. Um, and these, these, train, these trains are moving through our communities. Teaneck has, you know, four to five freight trains coming through every, every day, 24 hours a day. And Teaneck is one of the uh, communities that doesn't have any at-grade crossings so that it's a section of track where trains often idle for hours and um, along Teaneck tracks very closely lie four schools and so my 
suggestion to the state legislatures, and they said it has to go, come from the federal government, is that um, why doesn't someone just pass a regulation that you can't idle within so many feet or, or so much distance from schools? And that might stop the idling in communities such as ours, which I just find very dangerous because there's, you know, as I say, four schools are in very close proximity. Yeah, unfortunately, there's something, again, we didn't get to talk about everything. There's something called preemption, uh, where because the federal, the, the railroads are federal, uh, you know, or, or national. Uh, and so the preemption for the railroads essentially means they own the railroad, they own that land, um, they can preempt any local laws. Um, so if, on a federal level. And so uh, an instance of this was when, when the oil train traffic was um, just going crazy out of North Dakota at the peak. They were parking these trains in the middle of towns in the crossings. So they would shut down traffic. Uh, you know, this was happening repeatedly. So, um, you know, the, you can't operate your, your town, you know, when no, nothing can move. And so they passed a local law saying, you're not allowed to idle blocking traffic. They lost. You, they, they just, the, it just gets dismissed because the, the, it's, it's the railroads, it's the, it supersedes it, it's their property, they can do whatever they want. So, yeah, they're near, idling near schools, and they're always, you know, the, the Lock Magantic disaster happened partially, as Bruce explained, because they turned off the locomotive, which shut down the brakes. Um, the trains are always on. You know, that's how, when they're parked, they're on. And so, yeah, that's diesel fumes going into your, you know, I wrote the book, a lot of it's based on my experience in Albany, where, which was the biggest oil distribution hub on the East Coast at the point. Um, elementary schools, you know, nursery schools, it's, 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 you know, it's, it's horrifying, but that's the reality. Yeah, even you had mentioned Baltimore before with some, uh, I mean, when we live in a home rule state, but even such, because it controls, the, the, the railroad runs on those tracks owned by the federal government, is there nothing that can be done in the air or anything else beyond no everything from your knowledge well it's not it's it's owned by the railroads it's not by the federal government but the, the laws are from or, the federal government yeah. but yeah there's there's really nothing i mean there have been there have been cases where uh they they well probably the most the worst case was uh they built in massachusetts right in the middle of a town near schools on top of their water supply their aquifer they built a, the largest i believe it was propane distribution facility in the state they didn't have to get any permits. Uh, they they just because it was on rail property. So um, you know the, the local community said you can't do this. You know what if this blows up? It's a real risk. Uh, and the railroad said we don't have to listen to anything you said, and they built it. And so you, you have very little say, or uh, they really can do what they want. The only reason that they were able to stop the uh, in Baltimore. In, in Portland, Oregon, in a lot of places on the West Coast in California to block new infrastructure is because it was the oil companies that owned the unloading facilities. If those had been owned by rail companies, they would have built every one of them. Yeah, there have been um, municipalities have had much more success uh, in the U.S. than in Canada. Uh, uh, we've mentioned some of them, California, in, in Oregon, et cetera. Uh, there was... Uh, uh, there's a, one very important case in, in Canada where they tried to, and it was actually the indigenous communities uh, that that were pushing it and were trying to take court action uh, against the province of New Brunswick uh, that had sanctioned uh, a rail loading facility, and and uh, and they they were unsuccessful in trying. To, uh, communities all through Quebec where these trains were passing was uh, was uh, uh, petitioning and trying to convince the, the Canadian transport minister to um, you know to stop it or to uh, in, investigate it and 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 assess and take action on uh, on the effect uh, and the danger the health effect and the danger and yet they were unsuccessful in in uh, convincing the transport minister to go ahead and take that action. Uh, I think we're gonna take one more question and then uh, we'll let Rhoda close it out uh, for us. Matt. Yeah, hi. Um, 
first of all, thank you, um, Justin and Bruce, for coming to New Jersey and for all the good work that you do. Um, I'm an organizer here uh, working on these issues, and we simply couldn't do the work we do without investigative journalism and research. Um, I just wanted to mention uh, the LNG rail LNG by rail permit that the Trump administration approved through New Jersey, it would um, actually come into New, the, the most likely rail line that it would come into New Jersey on would cross the Delaware River into Pensacon, uh, which is in Camden County. It would go right through the city of Camden and in total over 12 municipalities in South Jersey in Camden and Gloucester County, um, if and when that does get up and running. Um, I couldn't help but think of Australia when I saw the pictures of the size of the explosion and the devastation wrought in Lac Megantic, and then I couldn't help but think about California, and I couldn't help but think about Puerto Rico and, uh, and India and the Philippines and Paris, France, and everywhere and every day another disaster breaking loose due to our addiction to fossil fuels. And, and really not an addiction that we are um, voluntarily uh, uh, you know, prolonging. This is an addiction that is forced on us and that is being perpetuated by the very interests uh, who tried to deny the science for decades. Um, and now they're using sheer force through the capture of our regulatory systems and our electorate to keep us hooked on, on fossil fuels. Um, the LNG by Rail project is just one of 12 fossil fuel expansion projects here in New Jersey. Governor Murphy has the authority to block every single one of these. Um, instead, he's chosen a couple to block and he gives out permits to others. He permitted this facility in Gibbstown, New Jersey to allow this fracked, liquefied frack gas to be shipped by rail and truck into Gibbstown, New Jersey. He's given land use permits to the, the Meadowlands power plant that we eventually stopped. Um, but I just wanted to suggest that one common denominator amongst many of these things is none of this happens without the fracking boom. We don't have the LNG by rail. We don't have the Bakken crude by rail. Um, and we don't have these fossil fuel power plants and things being proposed here in New Jersey if we're able to build the political will um, to, to win a ban on fracking and win policies like a strong Green New Deal. I feel like we're, we're no longer in a moment where we can think about incremental change as the sole solution to these problems with the climate crisis bearing down on us. So my question, sorry for, for the very long introduction, but the question is, do you, um, do you see the, like, the activism around the rail industry and the fossil fuel industries um, risking our communities through this, these very dangerous methods of transporting fossil fuels, um, connecting with these broader movements to really facilitate the, the rapid and fair transition we need to, to renewables and, and a whole range of alternative solutions. So and Matt is our uh, Food and Water Watch representative for New Jersey, so thank you for bringing that. And, and maybe I would ask you both as you answer Matt's question to also share any closing remarks that you uh, want to share with us at the same time. Yeah, I, in my experience, um, I certainly know that the people in Albany when I was there, uh, the, the, the group fighting the oil by rail was called PAWS, which was people from Albany United for Safe Energy. Uh, all those people are working on on issues. That, you know, if you talk to any of these people, um, they will say just you know the, the goal is to keep it in the ground, right? Uh, and so uh, that's certainly um, I think a, a big part of the activism I've seen. Um, I've been to uh, there was a, a 2015. I went to a national conference uh, activists from across the country um, in, in Pittsburgh uh, coming together on this issue. Um, and in, in all honesty, I believe. After the boom, you know, as the rail traffic went down, you know, people in Albany aren't really motivated to fight this right now because there are no oil trains coming to Albany ever since the price dropped. All those people are working on these other issues in, in some way. So I do, um, I, I think there's a real connection to it. And I do agree with you that, um, you know, a lot of my work now is about the fracking industry. And yes, all of these things are linked, especially LNG. There's just way to, the natural gas industry is losing a lot of money right now in the US. 
Um, they want to turn it all into liquefied natural gas and export it to other countries. Obviously, that's horrible for the climate, uh, um, but um, they and this is like their last attempt to try to salvage their industry, um, which, uh, again, as I mentioned, um, something I'm slightly optimistic about. They can't keep losing money forever, uh, and the price of natural gas will then have to go up which makes renewables that much more affordable. Um, and so natural gas will not be able to compete with renewables, in my opinion, five years from now. That said, just like with everything else we're, I talked about, across this country on a state level and also on a federal level, they're putting laws in place to make natural gas, uh, they passed just today right across the river in New York City. Uh, they passed a new uh, bill uh, the, for Con Ed, uh, they're going to raise the rates for the ratepayers in Con Ed so they can build a bunch of new natural gas pipelines in New York City. Uh, New York has passed the CELCPA, which is their climate legislation. They're supposed to, I don't know the exact details, but uh, it's about uh, getting to uh, carbon neutral and all renewables uh, in the future. Building new pipelines now that will be in the ground for 30 to 50 years is directly in opposition to that. Uh, but the governor uh, and, uh, and the politicians in New York have, have okayed this. So, um, you, you know, you're, you're facing that those issues. But fracking and natural gas, um, in, in my opinion, there should be no new natural gas infrastructure built in this country. There's no need for it. But the politicians have so much power. And. Uh, states like Ohio, nuclear and coal are getting bailed out. The Trump administration has been trying to bail out the coal. I mean, if the coal industry can't succeed with the Trump administration in power, uh, where every major regulatory position is staffed by a coal lobbyist, uh, you know, the head of the EPA was run by a coal lobbyist, uh, th that means coal is dead economically. So if coal has no future in the U.S. It, it, it still has a future in uh, some other countries. But uh, yes, um, uh, you know, all of these things are tied together, and but um, uh, my fear is when they build a new pipeline, they're going to use that for 30 years, and that's that's why they're building. There's too much infrastructure. There's too much gas. They know they want to lock in the infrastructure, and so they can just send then say to ratepayers, we can't build solar because we're already giving you your 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 your, your energy by gas. Yeah, I, the, just want to make the first point I want to make is the irony of the fact that Lac Megantic happened uh, in, in, uh, it, on a train carrying fracked gas from North Dakota, and fracked, fracking has been banned in Quebec uh, for years. There have been efforts, uh, but the oil industry really doesn't have any foothold. There is no. Uh, there is refining industry, uh, uh, refining of oil, but there's no extraction uh, in Quebec, and so any efforts to get fracking, uh, uh, and and there were, believe me, there were efforts by by the industry, but they've been unsuccessful. New Brunswick is another province where where it was banned, but unfortunately the premier. Uh, is is uh, an exec former executive of Irving Oil, which is that big oil company that where that that was that was headed, um, and they're doing a lot of fracking in BC in British Columbia, uh, despite uh, uh, efforts to to have it stopped, and they're beginning they're they're constructing right now a huge LNG pipeline from north northwestern Alberta, northeastern BC out to the to the coast in Prince Rupert and Kitimat for export uh, and it, it, there's been, it's been a it's it, uh, it's it's been very controversial uh, First Nations uh, have been uh, have been out there uh, barricading and they've been uh, uh, and they've been put in jail uh, uh, so it, it it is a very controversial subject uh, on, the, on, the, on, on the issue more generally, we are in a climate emergency. Uh, I, was, I was, had dinner last night with my friend and former colleague Seth Klein, who some of you may know his sister Naomi, uh, is, is, is writing a book on comparing the mobilization, the climate mobilization uh, that is needed uh, to what was done in terms of mobilization during World War II. 
uh, it's a it's a fascinating book. I've read his 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 uh, his first draft. So I I mean I totally agree with you. I think it's really important when we talk about um, um, you know net zero, um, reducing and eliminating carbon emissions. We have to talk about just transition for workers. We have to talk about this this they're un, they're not con, they're not unconnected to the state of equality, inequality in both our countries. Uh, and, and, and so I think when, when we talk about the, the effort to get to climate zero, we have to, we have to, we can't, we can't disconnect the issues of transition for workers who are in the industry, real alternatives for them. They, it has to be as a high priority. Uh, our government, uh, our federal government has made some nice promises, um, but there's the policy action. There's no plan. You know, yeah, we want to get to net zero. We're in a climate emergency. We want to get to net zero by by 2050, but there's no plan. So the policies, uh, I hope they will be pushed to put in the concrete policies that will align with their nice intentions. But that's not there. And there are lots of climate denialists and they're and they're focused in the oil provinces uh, of notably Alberta and Saskatchewan which isn't to say it's it's monolithic in terms of people's views on that because you know you get the impression you know, there's a government th that's now in power that are super denialists um, but uh, uh, you know that's that's the reality that we're dealing with uh, in, in Canada. Yeah, um, well, let's give uh, Justin McCullough and Bruce Campbell a big hand. Um, I know they're, they're... And hopefully they'll stick around a little bit. Their books are outside. Maybe they can sign them for you. Uh, but Rhoda, please close us out. I don't know about you, but I certainly learned a lot. Did you? And we're going to have to keep on this issue. And uh, if you signed up to be on our notice list, you'll be getting updates on this issue because we have to know how to fight this. So thank you. And thank you.